Welcome to FCOB. My name is Pastor Josh. I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, we have a few announcements for you this morning before we get into worship. Uh, the first one is the pastoral search team for the new family ministries pastor has been formed. An email was sent out with more information about the team. If you did not receive that email or would like a printed copy of the information, that info is available at guest services, and you can also make sure your email is correct and you can get those emails. Uh, we have listening sessions for the draft budget for the upcoming fiscal year. It will be presented and feedback will be received by leadership at the upcoming budget listening sessions. There will be a session next Sunday at 1230 and then another one on Tuesday, April 16th at 7 p.m. Both sessions will be held in the NPR and all are encouraged to attend that. Uh, today is the last day to purchase tickets for the spring tea, which is this Saturday, April 13th. So please visit the table in the hallway today to purchase tickets. Uh, there is also a prayer for the unsaved class that happens on Thursday from 10 to noon in the media center. And so if that's something on your heart, feel free to come out for that. Uh, if you need more information, you can look in your bulletin or ask guest services. Let's go to the Lord in prayer before we worship. Father, thank you for today and allowing us to gather here as we worship you through song, as we worship you through the message, as we worship you through prayer. Let us turn our hearts to you. Let us focus on who you are, the baggage that we have from the past week, the pain, the hurt, the frustration. I pray that we brought it here with us this morning. I pray that our baggage that's weighing us down is here with us today so that we can lay it at your feet. That we don't have to pretend to be happy or everything's going well just because we're at church. But that we can bear one another's burdens that we can come to the foot of the cross and worship with one another and lay down what's weighing us down. So as we worship, I pray we focus on you and bring all of our junk, all of our stuff to you. I ask all of this in Christ's name. Amen. I was glad when he said, let us come to the house of the Lord to worship. Are you glad to be here this morning? Stand and worship with us.
You know, it's a Sunday after Easter, so let's give him praise for all that he's done. today that we're going to be looking at with Pastor Peter in a few minutes is from Matthew 8, 5. Blessed are the pure in hearts, for they will see God. And so we're going to ask God right now to give us clean hands. Spirit, come make us humble. 
seated. If you are a child in third grade or younger, you're dismissed to Children's Church at this time. Uh, if you have a tithe or an offering, uh, you can put it in the box in the back after the service. But let us go to the Lord in prayer at this time. God, we again thank you for today. And we thank you for the blessings you've poured out on us. Open our hearts and our minds and our ears to the message this morning. In Christ's name, amen. Good morning. Somebody keeps moving my pulpit. And they know I'm fussy about order, and so... Needed a workout. Yes, he's getting his last digs in here in these remaining weeks. We are uh, back in Matthew uh, this morning, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 8, in these opening verses referred to as the Beatitudes, uh, which is a part of the larger Sermon on the Mount that we've um, embarked on. So let me read that verse uh, again. Thank you, Margaret, for reading it for us. But um, let me read it one more time. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. So much there. Let's bow our heads for just a moment. Lord, we do bow before you now, asking that the Spirit would allow us to hear from the God who speaks so that we may better know the Son who saves. And it is in his name that we pray now. Amen. While I was um, preparing for this lesson, I, I tend to read a lot um, anyway, but then when it comes to preparing for a message, I read an awful lot in addition, and um, I came across a story from the LA Times that was written back in 1981 about a woman named Anna Mae Penica who was born blind. Anna grew up in a, in a really encouraging, supportive, loving household, and so she grew up and had a very positive perspective on life. She was the kind of person that loved life in general, everybody who knew her. Um, just knew she had a cheerful spirit. There was just something special about her. Well, at age 61, in that year, 1981, she had surgery to remove a cataract in her left eye. And as a result of this surgery, Anna could actually see for the first time in her life. Now, I, I looked and looked for the original article. I always like to go to the source if I can. I couldn't find it. So I don't know exactly to what extent she could see prior to this or how much she could see after this, given that typically the brain, the neural pathways have to develop in order for someone to understand what they're actually seeing. They might be able to see it, but the brain has to process what they're seeing in order for them to know what it is. But anyway, she did mention, though, as she regained her sight, that things appeared to be bigger and brighter than she'd ever expected them to be. Um, to some degree, and again, we don't know exactly to what degree, but to some degree she was able to recognize her husband and she was able to recognize a few close friends. But for most of the people that she knew, her mental image of them was either taller or shorter or heavier or thinner than she'd envisioned. So anyway, I, I, just, I, I bring this up in order for us to think about, try to imagine how diff different life must have been on that day for Anna. The first time she looked at the faces of those that she'd only to that point felt. Every morning, I can't imagine her getting up every morning wanting to look over and actually see her husband. She could go to the window and she could watch as the morning grew brighter and brighter and finally the sun would pop up and she'd see the sunrise 
And she could walk out and she could see green grass and blue sky. And then in the evening, she could return to that same window and watch as everything grew dimmer and dimmer and dimmer as the light faded away. She could visit friends. She could actually see her friends laugh. She could see the wrinkles of her friends as they laughed. There's something so endearing about that. Now, to those of us who have our vision, it might be difficult for us to really get a grip on what it was like for Anna to see for the first time. But I can say, if it were me, I'd probably get very little sleep as I took in every bit of every picture in my vision. In fact, I don't think I'd close my eyes for fear of missing something. Every view, every angle would become a cherished memory. It would just get better and better and better. I can only imagine the experience it was for Anna as she continued to develop her vision. And yet, we who have been called, we who have been saved into God's kingdom will one day experience something so much more amazing, something so much more indescribable. One day, according to Jesus, we will see God. We will see the one who created that blue sky. We will see the one who gave green to that grass, who painted those sunsets. That moment that we come eye to eye with Jesus will be more powerful, it will be more meaningful than all of the joys that we will have experienced here on earth. And I could probably go through every row and have you name some of the joys you've experienced here on earth. And there are no doubt wonderful joys. But I want you just for a moment to just get a sense of all of that, the whole culmination of joy in life and how little that will compare to the joy of seeing our Savior face to face. That first time Anna opened her eyes, she undoubtedly was excited and she was thrilled. But on that day when we see Jesus, brothers and sisters, the joy we experience, there'll be no equal to it. There'll be no equal to it. Jesus said that seeing God will be a blessing, the blessing, for those who have a pure heart. Again, verse 8, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Now, for some context here, I want to back up and remind us that the first three of these Beatitudes that we looked at focused on the need to know who we are before a holy God, to know who we are, to recognize what Jesus calls our spiritual poverty, to realize the need to mourn over our own sin and to see meekness as the result of, of finally getting it, of finally breaking through and realizing this is who I am standing before a holy God. And then Jesus described the blessing. He, he described the contentment that we experience because we've recognized our need. There's actually blessing in recognizing just what a mess we are. There's contentment because we see that need and as a result we then have hungered and we've thirsted for righteousness. As the, as the Spirit fills us with that satisfaction, we become increasingly merciful, he said. Our, our focus this morning, we become pure in heart, more pure in heart. Now, definitions for clarity are always a good place to start, just so we're all on the same page. So what then does pure in heart, what does a pure heart actually look like? What does it mean? Well, first, when Scripture mentions the heart, what exactly is it talking about? Of course, modern culture has co-opted that term to mean merely one's emotions, Anytime somebody's talking about their heart today, they're talking about their emotions. So much of the entertainment media today is about following one's heart to true happiness, right? Just follow your heart. That's all you need to do. By the way, that's probably the worst advice you could ever follow. If anybody tells you just follow your heart, 
No, just turn around and follow the exit sign and leave. Because when it comes to morality, when it comes to decision-making, your emotions are not going to be trustworthy. Nobody's emotions are. So biblically, then, the heart is the center of your personality, if you will. It's reflective not of what you are so much as who you are. The heart is the person's foundation. It's where all the thoughts and passions and desires and emotions and beliefs reside. That's what your heart is. Which means that the heart can then be the location of all your problems, can't it? And think about all the warnings that Scripture gives us along these lines about our heart. A couple of examples. First one from Jeremiah, if you could change that. What, what did the prophet say? The heart is deceitful above all things. I, I, I chuckle when I see this verse. I love the verse, but I just think about how contrary the message in the culture is today. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? And a little later in Matthew, Jesus says, what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. And that's what defiles the person. You take any problem in this world, any trouble in a person's life, anything that leads to distress or affliction, and you're going to find that ultimately the problem originated right here. Not my heart, in your heart, or my heart, well, who's ever heart? And it originates with an unworthy, un an unholy desire, a feeling about someone. And that's because the Scripture says we are at our core, in our hearts, desperately wicked and deceitful. That's not, that's not popular language today, I understand, but it is biblical language and we want to be biblical students. We cannot change that part of us on our own, which is why the gospel matters to everyone. This is why we preach the gospel. This is why we teach the implications of the gospel. Because only God can change that part of us. And He can only change that part of us through the forgiveness that His Son offers. So that's the heart. Secondly, this term pure. That seems like a pretty simple concept. You probably notice when you buy a bottle of water, the label says mostly pure doesn't say mostly, it says 99 point whatever, but it means mostly pure. Because anytime you add additional agreements to that pure water, you realize it's no longer pure water. It may look pure, it may taste pure, in other words, there's no taste to it, but actually it can't be because pure water is just water, H2O. It hasn't been contaminated with anything. In the Greek, pure is the same word that would have meant unadulterated or unalloyed or unmixed, real or genuine or undivided. That's an interesting term, undivided. In fact, one of the commentators I read suggested that verse 8 could be translated, blessed are those whose hearts are undivided, for they will see God. I think that begins to make sense as we consider what Jesus might have thought about as he, as he spoke these words. Psalm 24, for instance, beginning at verse 3, Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in His holy place? Well, he who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to an idol or swear by what is false. Or Psalm 86 at verse 11, Teach me your way, O Lord, and I will walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. Isn't that one of our ongoing struggles as believers today? On the one hand, we want to know and we want to worship and we want to praise this amazing God of ours. And yet, on the other hand, we want something else. We know we have all we could ever need or want in the Lord, and yet we want something else. 
It's because our hearts are divided, and we're constantly battling that. It's, it's Romans 7. We, we delight in God's law while at the same time battle against His law and His, and, and His own nature. I love your law. I hate your law. I love your law. I don't want to obey your law. It's this constant battle that we face. So to be pure then is to be singularly focused to be open to the light of Christ. Now, we're going to study Matthew 6 later, but just look at verses 22 and 23 with me for a moment. Jesus says, The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? So purity then relates with whether or not our, our eyes are good, if you were, metaphorically speaking. Meaning they're opened, they're receptive to whatever is holy and righteous. So then to have a pure heart is to be like the Lord Jesus Himself. To have as your, as your overwhelming foremost concern, passion, overwhelming desire. I want to have an undivided love for Him. I want my love to be so singularly focused with the concerns and the worries and the, and the, and the temptation and all of the things that would typically trip me up aren't going to do so. A pure heart, then, is a heart that relentless, relentlessly pursues the great commandment to love the Lord, your God, with all your heart and soul and mind. It relentlessly pursues a life of glory to God. It relentless, relentlessly pursues the desire to know Him and to serve Him. In other words, you, you never claim to have moral standards without actually believing in those standards. Because to be relentlessly pursuing a life of glory to God is to pursue a life that is free of hypocrisy. In purity, there can be no pretense, no make-believe about your character. You can't fool the Lord. Why would you even try? You know, throughout the Old Testament, the prophets warned Israel time and again that to follow the law and to practice the rituals of, of sacrifice and of circumcision, to obey the law outwardly, but then to not have a love and a desire for God's law was simply to fool themselves. You can go through the motions, but it doesn't mean anything. And in fact, it's quite insulting. Deuteronomy 10, 16, for instance, Moses warned that to mark oneself with the sign of the covenant between God and His people, and you'll recall in the Old Testament that would have been circumcision. So to be circumcised and yet to maintain a hard heart, to be cold, to be callous toward all that is holy, well, it meant that that circumcision was meaningless. You went through those motions for nothing. It's the heart, it's your very being that has to be circumcised, that has to be set apart, reflective of the relationship. It's like baptism today. If you're baptized today without any real evidence that the Lord has convicted you of sin, if you, if you go into the water and you haven't repented of that sin and you haven't been forgiven for your sin, well, that makes entering the water just simply a waste of time. It's an outward expression of nothing because nothing inwardly has changed. In fact, it's offensive to him. 1 Samuel 15, the priest, Samuel, he asked Israel rhetorically whether the Lord delighted in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as he delighted in their obedience to him. He knew the answer. He was simply stating the obvious because then he replied, to obey 
is better than to sacrifice. In other words, you can appear loyal, you can appear faithful to God, you can impress your brothers and sisters with your actions, you can even fool yourselves. Somehow convince yourself that what you're doing is for the good of of your relationship with the Lord. But you can't fool God because He knows the truth about us. He knows our hearts. He knows our hearts better than we know our hearts. That's why, on the one hand, you could declare that you would never commit adultery against your spouse while at the same time having ungodly thoughts about somebody else. That's why we can gather for worship, a time to come together as a body and praise the name of Jesus and celebrate our life in Him together, and at the same time our minds can be on, well, what's happening this afternoon? Did I forget to turn the stove off this morning? What is happening tonight? Oh, I've got three meetings next week. Or you could show somebody mercy and kindness Not necessarily because you want to honor the Lord through those actions, but because you need the praise that comes with it. Jesus' brother had a name for this. He called this being double-minded. Double-minded. It's tantamount, he said, to serving two masters. It just won't work because what happens is you end up loving the one master and honoring that one master while ignoring or even hating or despising the other one. A pure heart requires that God be your sole master. And brothers and sisters, you know that there is a lot in life today that is vying for that title, master, in your life. It's constant. The things, the people, the events that tend to pull you away from Him, the schedule. None of this is in and of itself sinful, but it's what we allow it to do, pull us away from the Lord. The many things we need to be doing, the career we have to keep up with, the demands. And if you're married and you have children, then, of course, they're imposing their needs and and their expectations on you as well. It's so easy for us to point, to point over, this is where the distraction is over here. Or th- it's over here. This is where the distraction is. If only I could get rid of that, life would be fine. That's why so many people anticipate retirement as this amazing transformation that takes place, only to find out life really hasn't changed, at least inside, because you're still dealing with the same mess. The greatest challenge is in our own hearts. Now, why am I spending so much time defining this? Well, we need to understand the distinction that Jesus is drawing through these Beatitudes between having that hunger and that thirst for righteousness and merely trying to do something religious. We need to understand the distinction between the state of being spiritually poor and just coming to church and perhaps participating in some activity. We need to be able to distinguish between living a holy life and merely showing an interest in the parts of the Bible that we find palatable or socially acceptable. In other words, to have a pure heart in God's eyes, it requires an all-consuming level of faithfulness and protection. And as I hope that we are all beginning to realize now, that is something that we can never accomplish on our own. In fact, there is only one solution. There has only ever been one solution. And that comes from an act of God's grace. It comes from trusting and believing that when Jesus died on His cross, your, my, impure, selfish, angry, bitter, lying, cheating heart died with Him. And to accept His death, and to accept His death and all that it can mean for you is to allow God then to replace that impure, selfish heart with His own. 
genuine believers, Christians, Christ followers, can have a pure heart through the sacrificial love of Jesus. Friends, that is amazing. That is amazing. Because according to verse 8, when that happens, we're then able to see God. We're able to be in His presence. Verse 8, one more time. Blessed are the pure in heart, or bless, God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. Now, what exactly does that mean, to see God? Does this mean that, that there's this spiritual state that we can attain that, that will allow us to see Him with our eyes physically? I can't see God now, but now I can see God. Or was Jesus referring to seeing God in a spiritual sense? And this is even more confusing when we think about John 1 and verse 18, when it tells us that no one has ever seen God. Well, which is it? Are we going to see God or no one's ever seen God? Well, John there was describing the spiritual nature of God and that as spirit, we are limited in what we can actually see. God did appear on earth in the form of a, of, in the form of a theophany, which is a $5 word that basically means a physical manifestation of God. God appeared, but He appeared in or through something else or someone else. Remember Abraham, Jacob, Moses... They saw God in the form of something or someone else. Abraham met, you remember, he met and he showed hospitality to two angels of the Lord. They were theophanies, representatives of God. Moses talked with God at the burning bush. The burning bush was a theophany. But still, even though it was a theophany, Moses hid his face because he was afraid there. He was afraid of even the representation of God. And then later in Exodus 33, God told Moses that he couldn't see God's face because no one looked at God and lived. What does that mean? Well, in seeing God in, in the fullness of His glory, that would be more than any sinful human being could tolerate. The shame would literally kill the person. The very being of God is so transcendent, so far beyond the range of, of our human experience that our attempt to see or understand Him will just fail, which is why Scripture never bothers to describe God. You'll notice except in terms of His attributes, His holiness, His goodness, His faithfulness, His omniscience. And yet, here we are in verse 8. We're given this amazing promise by Jesus that the pure in heart will see God. So what's he talking about there? Well, I, I would suggest there's at least a twofold way of looking at this. There are probably other ways. These two seemed appropriate and, and, and accurate. First of all, we can, we can see or recognize God today while we're here in this world. We can see or recognize Him here. In fact, the purer our hearts become, the more we'll see God in this life. The more our hearts are focused on Him, the more our hearts are absorbed with Him, concentrated on Him, the more we are free of distractions, the more we have that singular focus, the more we'll see Him. And the, I think, obvious example to consider is His creation, His nature. 17th century Puritan minister Richard Baxter said, the whole creation can be man's book in which he is to read the nature and will of his creator. The whole of nature you can read like a book and see God the creator through it. Anybody see the sunrise this morning? You did? I did. Wow. Turn the page. I have no doubt Baxter took that, that concept, that idea from Psalm 29, where David wrote about watching a thunderstorm. 
among other things. But he mentions this thunderstorm and he, and he ascribes to, he credits God with the lightning and the thunder and the powerful winds that we used to tell our kids when they were little. Oh, don't be afraid of that. God's at work. That's just God working. Oh, okay. You see, only his people can look at a storm and recognize that's the power of God. Right? Only God's people can do that. There's also God in history. I love history, and in part I love history because I can see where God has imposed His his sovereign rule. History just affirms what I believe when I see God working there. But there's also our personal history. Who of you can look back on your life and remember where you were, spiritually speaking, before the Lord called you? Your own history speaks to the sovereignty, the love, and the grace of God. The ways that He led you closer. The ways He he providentially introduced you to certain people in your life. You can look back and see that path, can't you? Well, I hadn't met this person. They wouldn't have introduced me to this person. And that person wouldn't have brought me into that particular congregation. And I wouldn't have found Christ. Or in whatever way it happened. You know, when your heart is pure, you can, you can see God in the doctor and the nurse who spends that extra few minutes with you. The physician's assistant who comes along and just gives you that pat on the shoulder and says, you're going to be all right. You can see God in the brother or the sister who, who checks in on you to see how you're doing and maybe brings you a meal. You can see God as His Spirit reassures you that, well, regardless of what happens, I can sleep at night because I know He's in control because you believe everything's going to be okay. I had a conversation yesterday with a friend, been a friend now 30 years, and he discovered he has cancer, and one of my first questions was, so how are you doing? And, and he's, he's never one to, to express a lot of emotion. He was just a very factual, straightforward guy. He says, well, I know I'm going to be okay. I said, I know, but how are you feeling about all of this? He says, it's the way it is. God's in control. There's not much I can do about it. Because he rules. And I said, well, thank you. I needed to hear that because I was emotionally kind of a mess yesterday finding out about my friend. Come to find out he's got it handled better than I do. Some of you are familiar with the story of Job in the Old Testament. Job definitely discovered the highs and lows, the best and worst of life. Look at uh, chapter uh, chapter 42, verse 5 there. It says, my ears had heard of you, But now my eyes have seen you. The name Christopher Ash is a name that I would encourage you to be familiar with. He's a pastor, a teacher, um, wonderful author. But he wrote extensively on Job. And he helped, helped me, he's helped many people explain Job, and in particular this verse, prior to all that Job had experienced, all of loss, all of the pain, Job's understanding of God was quite limited. It was limited to the philosophers and the theologians that he'd heard. He'd heard that there was an almighty God who was righteous and all-powerful, and so in the world then, certain things were expected, morally speaking. You know, crime, crime would be met with punishment. Virtue would be met with reward. All this Job had heard. And so then verse 5 comes along, but now my eyes have seen you. There's a clarity that he hadn't experienced before. He came to realize that God could do anything, that his purpose was, his purpose is to accomplish his will, and that God's grace was sufficient for him. We 
we can recognize God in this world. The other way, at least for this morning, the other way we can think of Jesus' promise in verse 8 is that while we can, while we can see, while we can recognize God today, there will be, there is no, there will be no comparison to what will be. 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 12, Paul said that now we see, but in a poor reflection as in a mirror, but then we're going to see face to face. Today in Christ, we can see like we've, we've never seen before. There's no question about that. If you have found new life through Jesus Christ, your vision improves dramatically, spiritually speaking. The world begins to make sense. And we have experienced some wonderful joys. Amen? We could go through row by row. I could ask you to share your joys. They're, I mean, they're overwhelming what God has done in our lives. Deep relationships among brothers and sisters, family and friends. We've experienced some of the most beautiful sights on the planet. We've watched loved ones attain goals. Nothing better than seeing someone we love excel. We've even been present at some of the most difficult moments in each other's lives. There's joy in that. Despite its pain, there's beauty in seeing God's hand in what is intimate. But can we compare any of that with being in the presence of the one who made it all possible? Think about that. We benefit, we celebrate the product or the created which can never compare to the Creator. Never. You and I are going to enjoy God and spend eternity in His holy and glorious presence. The, the, the blessedness of this is inconceivable. There, there aren't the English words, there aren't the words, period that can describe. It is so beyond our imagination. So back to my story about Anna, just for a moment. We'll close here. Forty years she's blind. And it turns out that, in a sense, it was 40 years wasted. Now, certainly God in His sovereignty worked all this out according to His will and to His perfect timing. So I don't mean it's a waste in that sense. But what I do mean is, as the doctor completed his surgery on Anna, he told her, hey, you realize you could have had this surgery 40 years ago? Imagine. Unfortunately, she didn't know because nobody told her. Well, I'm telling you with, with, with much love, that some of you are spiritually blind this morning. But God can heal you. His Spirit is nudging you right now, perhaps. Perhaps lately there's been this, this heaviness on your conscience and you cannot quite figure out where it's coming from. It's troubled. And today is the day that you can believe and accept Jesus Christ. You can accept His death for your sin. And all the attempts that you have gone through to save yourself, the ways that you've tried to be good, have been simply a waste of time. Because, friends, you and I can never do enough for heaven. So the good news is you can stop trying. You can stop trying to run that race. You can repent of your sin and you can turn to Him. Hebrews 3, while it is still called today, if you hear His voice, don't turn away. Don't distract yourself. Don't leave here this, this afternoon and just find something to do. Respond. Stop running. 
and then celebrate a new and pure heart with God as a result of His work in your life. And you, brothers and sisters, I pray that what Jesus has written and what we have studied this morning will challenge you as well. God has given you a new heart already, but we have to continue to pursue purity, not in some way that we need to earn our place. That's never possible. But like Paul said in Philippians 2, we need to continually be working out our salvation, working it out, our life demonstrating that increasingly pure heart and allow His Spirit to work and to shape and to change and to encourage and to mold us and to correct us so that we can then live for His good pleasure. Life here is short. We know that. Death is a reality that waits every person. So yes, we live to see God today, no question. But we anticipate. We have expectation for heaven. Seeing Him, but also seeing ourselves changed forever. Saved forever. His forever. Let's pray. Father, how we do long to see you better and better and more clearly. We recognize that so much of that challenge is allowing you to work within us to get ourselves out of the way so that your Holy Spirit can continue to grow us up. Father, I pray that if there's somebody here this morning that that has been moved, that has been made uncomfortable, that has been touched by, by your word this morning, they wouldn't just get up and leave and distract themselves, but that they'd take that time right now to allow you in to do your work. Father, we give you thanks and we give you praise for vision privilege of seeing you in all your glory. Amen. His forever. Let's stand as we close our service as we sing Who You Say I Am. Oh
thank you for worshiping with us today. As Peter was talking about the sunrise and David describing the thunderstorm, I don't know if you all have heard, uh, but there's an eclipse tomorrow. Not, not widely publicized. But when you look at it, if you decide to look at it, first of all, wear the proper sun gear. You know, don't just stare at the sun. Uh, but meditate on God's power and his glory and his mightiness when you witness that. And have a great week. Thank you.